Hey, I'm Nina. Just a heads up, hit that like and subscribe button for more of my wild journey. Now, let's get into it. Freshman year at UCLA was a blast and a blur, but among the most vivid memories was meeting Martin. We bumped into each other at a campus coffee shop. I was your typical bookworm, buried in economics texts, and he was, well, let's just say he was hard to miss. Watch out, he exclaimed, as we collided and my books tumbled to the floor. Sorry, my bad, I muttered, feeling my cheeks warm up. He helped me pick up my books, and we got talking. Turns out we had a lot in common, especially our majors. Martin was studying business, and I was in economics. We hit it off instantly. We started hanging out more and more. But there was one thing I kept to myself. My family's wealth. It wasn't something I was comfortable flaunting or even mentioning. Martin didn't need to know about the private jets, the mansions, or the luxury. Not yet, anyway. Fast forward to junior year. We were at my place, cramming for finals. That's when Martin saw the family portrait. It was hard to miss. This grand, almost regal photo hanging on the living room wall. Is that your family? You guys look like celebrities, he joked, not realizing how close to the truth he was. I sighed. Yeah, that's us. We're, well, we're pretty wealthy. Martin was taken aback. I could see the wheels turning in his head. He was cool about it, though. Didn't treat me any differently. But I could tell it changed something. He started seeing my world. The charity events, the extravagant parties. It was a lot for him, but he adapted. Slowly, but surely. And then there was Rebecca, my cousin. She was everything I wasn't. Where I was reserved and modest. She was flamboyant and extravagant. She loved the spotlight and had no problem spending our grandfather's money on the latest fashions, the newest cars. Martin saw this too. He was intrigued, maybe even a little envious of her lifestyle. It was a stark contrast to my approach to our family's wealth. Eventually, Martin and I graduated. He proposed on a quiet, starlit night. It was simple, intimate, and perfect. We got married in a lovely ceremony surrounded by our closest friends and family. My grandfather, being the generous soul he was, gifted us a beautiful house. It was more than generous, but it was his way of showing love. That's when the real problem started. Martin began questioning why we didn't live more lavishly, why we didn't flaunt our wealth like Rebecca did. Why don't we travel more, buy something extravagant, he'd often ask. I just don't see the point in all that show, I'd argue back. Our fights about money became more frequent. He admired Rebecca's carefree attitude toward spending, and often suggested we should be more like her. It felt like he was slowly being seduced by the idea of a more luxurious lifestyle. At family gatherings, the difference in our approaches became glaringly obvious. Rebecca would boast about her latest escapades, her voice dripping with excitement and privilege. Martin would listen, enthralled, often chiming in with his own grand ideas. We should go on a shopping spree like that, Nina. Imagine the fun, he'd say, his eyes shining with a mix of excitement and longing. Lying in bed that night, I could feel the distance growing between us. It was like a silent storm brewing, threatening to tear apart the life we had built together. His fascination with Rebecca's world was becoming more apparent, and it scared me. I feared what it meant for our future, for our marriage. As I lay there staring at the ceiling, I wondered how long it would be before our differences became too much to bear. How long before Martin's desire for a more extravagant life would overshadow the love we had? Our five-year anniversary was around the corner, a milestone I thought would be special for both of us. I had planned a romantic getaway to our family's lake house, envisioning a serene weekend just for Martin and me. Little did I know, it would be anything but serene. Martin, I've booked the lake house for our anniversary weekend. It'll be perfect, I exclaimed, excited about the surprise. He forced a smile. Sounds great, babe. But isn't that the same weekend as Rebecca's birthday bash? The conflict was immediate. Rebecca had planned one of her infamous parties, and it was clear where Martin's interest lay. No, it's the following weekend, I lied, hoping to avoid an argument. He seemed relieved, and I felt a pang of guilt for deceiving him. As our anniversary approached, I could sense Martin's growing disinterest. He was distant, often lost in thought, and I feared I knew the reason. Despite my efforts, the lake house trip felt like an obligation to him, not a celebration. We arrived at the lake house, a beautiful, secluded spot surrounded by nature. It was peaceful, the kind of place that should have been perfect for reconnecting. 
but Martin's attitude was anything but romantic. Can't believe we're missing Rebecca's party for this, he muttered under his breath. I tried to brush it off, focusing on making the weekend special. Let's not think about that now. We're here to celebrate us, I said, trying to keep the mood light. That evening, we went to a quaint local restaurant for our anniversary dinner. It should have been a lovely evening, but Martin's behavior quickly soured the atmosphere. Why can't we just relax and enjoy some fancy champagne? He complained loudly, drawing stares from other diners. I felt my cheeks burning with embarrassment. Martin, please, let's just enjoy our dinner. His behavior escalated, becoming more disruptive, until the restaurant manager approached our table. Sir, I'm going to have to ask you to leave, the manager said firmly. Martin stood up, knocking his chair over in the process. Fine, I didn't want to be here anyway, he shouted, storming out. I was left alone, humiliated and heartbroken. I couldn't believe this was how our anniversary was turning out. I paid for the dinner and returned to the lake house alone, hoping Martin would come back and we could talk things through. But he didn't come back. Instead, I received a text from him. Got called into a work emergency, heading back to the city. Sorry, babe. I knew it was a lie. A pit formed in my stomach as I realized where he must have gone. Rebecca's party. I felt betrayed and alone, sitting in the vast emptiness of the lake house. The next morning, I received a tip from a mutual friend who had seen Martin and Rebecca together at the party. I was devastated, but needed to know the truth for myself. I drove back to the city, my mind racing with anger and sadness. I parked outside Rebecca's condo, my heart pounding in my chest. And there they were, Martin and Rebecca, laughing and kissing without a care in the world. I took out my phone and snapped a picture, my hands shaking. Without a second thought, I sent it to the family group chat. The evidence was there for everyone to see. Martin, don't bother coming home, I texted him, a mix of rage and sorrow overwhelming me. I watched as they parted ways, Martin looking at his phone, his face turning pale as he read my message. Rebecca seemed unfazed, almost smug. I realized then that I had lost not just my husband, but also a part of my family. I drove away, leaving behind the betrayal and lies. My heart was broken, but I knew I had to be strong. This was just the beginning of a new chapter in my life, one where I would have to pick up the pieces and move forward. The aftermath of Martin's betrayal was like navigating through a relentless storm. Every day, I woke up to a reality where the man I had loved and trusted was now a stranger intertwined with my cousin Rebecca in a scandalous affair. The day I filed for divorce was etched in my memory. The sterile, impersonal office of my lawyer seemed to amplify the gravity of the situation. As I signed the papers, each stroke of the pen felt like a final goodbye to the life I had envisioned with Martin. You're doing the right thing, Nina, my lawyer said, trying to offer some comfort. I know, I replied, my voice a mixture of resolve and sorrow, but it doesn't make it any easier. The news of our divorce spread rapidly within our family and social circles. Reactions varied from shock to sympathy, but one thing was clear. Martin was now an outcast, shunned by nearly everyone who once welcomed him. Except for Rebecca. They seemed to thrive in their bubble, blind to the damage they had caused. At family gatherings, seeing them together was a constant reminder of the betrayal. I could hear the whispers, feel the stares, it was as if they were living in a different world, one where consequences didn't exist. Can you believe those two? Aunt Linda would often mutter under her breath. I tried to ignore them, to focus on healing, but their presence was like a thorn in my side. In the midst of navigating this personal turmoil, tragedy struck again. My beloved grandfather passed away. His death was a profound loss that shook the foundation of our family. He was more than a grandfather to me. He was a mentor, a friend. Standing by his graveside, the reality of his absence hit me hard. I'll make you proud, Grandpa, I whispered, tears streaming down my face. His passing marked a new chapter in my life. I took on a more active role in our family business, something that I had always been hesitant about, but now it felt right, almost like a tribute to my grandfather. The boardroom became my new battleground. Long hours, endless meetings, and complex decisions became my new normal. The business world was challenging, but I was determined to succeed. Nina, the new marketing strategy you proposed is showing promising results. 
Mr. Johnson, our marketing head, commented during a meeting. I felt a sense of accomplishment hearing those words. It was a small victory, but it meant a lot. Despite my professional successes, the evenings were the hardest. The house felt empty without Martin. Memories of our time together haunted every corner. I'd catch myself setting an extra place at the dinner table, only to be reminded of the painful truth. During those lonely nights, I found strength in my work. I dove into financial reports, strategy meetings, and investor calls. It was exhausting, but it gave me a sense of purpose, a focus to channel my grief and anger. One night, as I sat alone in the living room, flipping through an old photo album, the weight of everything hit me. The lies, the betrayal, the loss of my grandfather. Tears streamed down my face as I closed the album. You're stronger than this, Nina, I told myself, wiping away my tears. You have to keep going. And I did. Day by day, I rebuilt my life. I focused on the business, on making a difference, on honoring my grandfather's legacy. It was a slow and often painful process, but I was determined not to let Martin and Rebecca's betrayal define me. As I prepared for a major business presentation, I reflected on the journey I had been on. It was filled with heartache and challenges, but also growth and resilience. I realized that no matter what life threw at me, I had the strength to overcome it. That night, as I lay in bed, I felt a sense of peace for the first time in months. I had come a long way, and though the road ahead was uncertain, I knew I was ready to face whatever came my way. The day of my grandfather's will reading was draped in a palpable tension, a blend of grief and anticipation. As I entered the attorney's office, the weight of the past year, the betrayal, the loss, the upheaval, seemed to converge into this single moment. The room was filled with family members, their faces a mosaic of various emotions. My eyes briefly met Rebecca's, her usual air of confidence replaced with a subtle unease. Martin wasn't there, a small mercy in this complex tapestry of family drama. Mr. Thompson, the family attorney, cleared his throat, signaling the beginning of the reading. As per Mr. Sterling's last will and testament, I braced myself, expecting the unexpected. The will was thorough, detailing various assets, trusts, and bequests. Then came the part that sent murmurs through the room. And to my granddaughter Rebecca, I bequeath nothing. The words hung in the air, stark and irrevocable. Rebecca's face drained of color, her shock mirrored by many in the room. Her betrayal, it seemed, hadn't gone unnoticed by my grandfather. The reading continued, and with each clause, my grandfather's intentions became clearer. He had seen the turmoil within the family, acknowledged it, and made his decisions accordingly. And to my granddaughter Nina, I leave a significant portion of my estate, including the family lake house. I was stunned. The lake house, the site of so many cherished memories, was now mine. It felt like a final, loving gesture from my grandfather, a sanctuary amidst the chaos of the past year. After the will reading, the family slowly dispersed, leaving me in a state of reflection. Rebecca left quickly, her dreams of inheritance dashed, her future uncertain. It was a few days later when Martin showed up at my door, his eyes a mix of regret and desperation. Nina, please, I need to talk to you, he pleaded, his voice barely above a whisper. I stood at the door, the barrier between us more than just physical. What is there to say, Martin? I'm sorry, Nina. I was a fool, and I realize that now. Can we just talk? I looked at him, really looked at him, and saw the man I once loved. But that love was gone replaced by a hard-earned wisdom. Martin, there's nothing left to discuss. What happened between us? It changed everything. But Nina, I... I wish you well, Martin. But it's over. Please, respect my decision and move on. With those final words, I closed the door gently but firmly. It was an act of closure, a necessary step in moving forward. In the weeks that followed, I poured myself into my new responsibilities both in managing my inheritance and in the family business. The lake house became a sanctuary, a place of peace and introspection. I often found myself sitting by the lakeside, the calm waters a balm to my once turbulent heart. It was there that I realized the depth of my own strength, the resilience I had built. I had overcome betrayal, faced loss, and emerged stronger. My journey wasn't easy, but it was mine. I had learned to find peace in solitude, to embrace the lessons life had taught me. 
As I looked out over the lake, the sun setting in a blaze of colors, I felt a sense of empowerment. My story wasn't defined by Martin or Rebecca or the pain they caused. It was defined by my response, my growth, my resilience. The future was uncertain, but it was also full of possibilities. I was ready for whatever lay ahead, armed with the knowledge that whatever challenges I faced, I would face them on my terms, with strength and grace. Now that we've reached the end of our story, I have a thought-provoking question for you. Do you think Nina should have given Martin a chance to explain himself, or was her decision to close the door on their past the right move? It's a tough call, balancing forgiveness and self-respect. Share your thoughts in the comments below. I'm really curious to see your perspectives. And hey, if you enjoyed this story and the journey we've been on together, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. Your support means a lot, and I can't wait to bring you more stories that spark conversation and thought. Thanks for watching.